Hi, thank you so much for joining us for the Pursuit Podcast. Today, we're going to be looking at what junior technologists, folks who are just starting out or just been in the industry a little while, what they can do on their personal portfolio sites to help them land that first job or get that great second job. I'm being joined today by... Hi, I'm Steve. I'm development director at a local Birmingham company called Majestic.com. We've been hiring interns for about eight or nine years now, but many graduates since. And uh, it's uh, generally described one of my most enjoyable aspects of my job as reaching out and uh, helping this new generation of technologists really sort of find ourselves a foothold in the industry. I was really excited to be talking to you. Full disclosure for folks listening, uh, I worked with Steve a few years ago and was just absolutely delighted with his hands-on approach to hiring and management and just being incredibly (laughs) newbie-friendly. Gee, gosh. (laughs) Thanks, Jess. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, fantastic to be here today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So when you see junior technologists and their websites, do you, is that what, sort of one of the ways you first encounter them? Or do you generally see a CV first? How do you encounter the bright new things in the wild? I tend to get around the local campuses more than a politician at election time. So uh, it's a rare event will happen at Aston University without me or one of my colleagues floating around somewhere just trying to be nice to the students. Uh, We really try to operate on a zero-hassle engagement policy. It's very important to us. Uh, I think an awful lot that people don't realise when they first try to get into tech is that it's very much a two-way relationship. It's about a matter of finding an employer that's suitable for you as much as the employer that is finding people that are suitable for their cultures, their roles and their systems and their way of operating. And the sort of open environment that we've tried to encourage at Majestic is great for some people, but for others it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and I think really when, when you're taking those first few steps out of university or into tech from a different background, really being aware of these sorts of cultural differences between employers and really trying to discover, because it's a long process, where you feel you fit into this sort of cultural matrix is uh, incredibly important. Just to go back to your question, so the contact points. Yeah, so we have informal contact We try to then, rather contradictorily, anonymise the recruitment process. So we don't really want any unknown bias by myself or the rest of the team to creep into it. So that's on uh, on receiving CVs or receiving resumes for American listeners? Exactly. So the the CVs themselves tend to be anonymised for first sift. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I strongly recommend employers do that. Yeah, I think it's, it's essential and, and sometimes it can surprise you. And it's, it's a learning process as well. Uh, I think everybody, most reasonable people don't want to admit that they've got any degree of bias whatsoever. And it's only by going through those procedures that you've kind of realise that, oh, crikey, I, I do turn out to be an arsehole in certain areas. I need to improve. Well, I, I think most people want to think we're good people. And I think most people are good people. And biases are just the bugs in your thinking process. I think really creating sort of unit tests, if that makes sense. (laughs) That's a delightful way of thinking about it. Um, Bugs in your thinking. Yeah. Um, So like folks who are biased are not necessarily bad people, but some people are jerks. I'll stop waffling. (laughs) Yeah. And I think the whole thing is that uh, extremes and absolutes aren't helpful to anyone. Yeah. They don't generally exist in the outside world. You can have somebody that is a jerk when it comes to X, but for all other things under the sun is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's important. So we've and so we've anonymized CVs. Now, the interesting thing with CVs is that they tend to come self-anonymized. And, uh, you know, every CV comes through and if they've got an academic background, it's, oh, look, they've gone to Thingamy School or X College and they've got a qualification in something relevant. And then they've come to university where they've been a member of a society and they've done these courses and got these grades. And, oh, look, they've just got space at the bottom. What's that? They're interested in reading, going to the cinema and socialising with friends. And really what I think in terms of the profile websites, their GitHub accounts, volunteered social media, I'd recommend nobody tries to go stalking your employees. That's just scary. Mm, yeah. I think that the filter level, especially for younger folks joining the industry... People forget sometimes that it's a broadcast mode. So you you might want to cast an eye over them to see, are they going to behave themselves reasonably on the internet as your employees? Uh, And I think the key thing with the CV and the whole profile site is that you've got the CV as this core linking document that goes out to your profile site, out to your GitHub account, to academic references and to the traditional forms of things. And these links that you declare, they become fair game. As you know, a, a decent forward-thinking employer, I would never go off-piste and then try to stalk them outside of those granted links. 
I imagine that some people do. I think it's questionable. I'm not a lawyer, but I think yeah. it's questionable legally. But yeah, where you disclose, be aware what you're disclosing, be aware of the history you're disclosing. That's a fantastic idea. So what kinds of things would you like to see on a, a sort of junior technologist profile site? What do you think they should include? And do you think there's any sort of way they should architect that information? So the information architecture, the presentation, it's it's all very challenging. And I got my first job not off the quality of my rather dubious um, degree, <laughs> uh, but instead off my own profile site. It's actually where I came into the industry. So way back in the late 90s, uh, I set up a JavaScript-based website with uh, nice windows. Is that, that still were, alive? Uh, no, no. Oh. It, it, it retired many years ago with my demon account. Um, oh, wow. Demon internet. Yeah, yeah I think sorry, that's still I just going. remembered that we're both old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now these whippersnappers are coming on. And uh, I see an awful lot of what I did mirrored in what they did. I and mean, all I tried to do was I explored the technologies I found interesting. I tried to relay and communicate that interest and that passion via my website. And I tried to do it in such a way that somebody that was unfamiliar with me was able to see my work and determine whether they valued it or not. That's such a good way to frame that. And I think really the key to that is, is the value exchange. This, I think, from my marketing lectures from the course I've been doing, uh, this creation of the, the creation of a mutually beneficial exchange. Ah, that's such an interesting point. I often think that whenever you're creating something or running an event or looking to create a community, that making sure it's mutually beneficial is the most important part. So if you say, uh, I love junior sites and junior technologist sites that offer technical content, so tutorials or even a review of a tutorial you've done. I really, really love ones that have technical blogs. And I talk to a lot of juniors who don't really know what to write about. So I always say, the last thing you've discovered, the last tip or trick, like if it was new to you, it's going to be new to thousands of people. Uh, the last thing that made you absolutely angry and frustrated, the last thing you've ranted about like professional, nice rants, or something you've, like a new technology or new tool you've just discovered. Like I find these are really, really wonderful, rich environments to find content. And I think it can be quite a challenge and for ourselves and uh, our years in industry. It feels a little bit easier to be naive and innocent at times. But when you're first starting out, I can remember um, looking at some of my peers and reflecting on my own content and thinking, why am I trying to pretend like I'm an expert at everything? It's, it's so much nicer when you see somebody with genuine honesty that just goes through this joy of discovery of something that maybe, yeah, I saw five, ten years ago. But that gives a different perspective to it. It gives a sense of enthusiasm. And I don't think anyone should ever be scared of admitting that they've gained in knowledge. In fact, it's, I think it's the one few people that I'm truly, truly fearful of in life are those who think that somehow they've reached the end of the learning journey and now they only have knowledge to give. Yeah. And, you know, really, as a human being... That, that frightens That's me. That's not how we're supposed to work as creative, intelligent animals. E exactly, yeah. So, you know, if, if we all came to that conclusion many, many decades ago, we'd still be sitting around the base of the trees banging rocks together. And oftentimes some of the content you put out that seems really, really basic, really 101 level. Uh, so Majestic does work with uh, search data and SEO data. Yeah. Uh, so discoverability, putting stuff out there that people genuinely want is really valuable. The best blog post I ever did was about how to add a Google Analytics code to WordPress. Tons of people know how to do this, but... Yeah, exactly, and yeah. you just have to communicate these, these easy little things to the next generation. And outside of Majestic, one of the things I do is I run the local uh, Java group in the West Midlands. And um, we've just started a scheme where we're actually encouraging uh, students at university. We've had first-year students all the way through to students later in, in their courses coming to us and actually doing lightning talks at the start of the session. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, so we had uh, Simon Ritter up from London to come and do a great talk. And, uh, yeah, his front man was a, a student that worked with us previously, just actually telling about this learning journey of him getting involved in Scala, which oh, was cool. an absolutely beautiful little story. And it, it just, I think the surprising thing for them was the level of enthusiasm across the rest of the audience, because there you've got you know, a seasoned industry vet who are still looking at this young description of a, a voyage of discovery with, you know, enthusiasm, with delight, with support. And really, I think everybody that's been through that program afterwards has just said what a rewarding experience it is. And I think, really, if you're going to reflect your own self in, in terms of your portfolio website, what you really need to do is not reflect just yourself, but your position within the wider community, 
these links to groups, these links to people, senior figures that you inspire you, um, to peers that you find amusing. Now, obviously, there's a need for moderation in terms of the volunteering of potentially dodgy skeletons in dodgy... Minimal com- swearing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Let's not make no, no, no beef about it. If, if you're in technology, chances are the work that you do could be seen by millions of people, especially if it's terrible. <laughs> Uh, and by terrible, I don't mean inadequate. What I mean is there's a lack of care, inappropriate swearing, inappropriate language, uh, sometimes even subtle things in the eyes of an employer, such as an inappropriate cha- choice of domain name. Yeah. I actually was putting down to talk about that. I think that domain names for professional sites are sort of the the email addresses of their day. Yeah, exactly. And I can remember having a scene uh, in previous applications, I'm not talking about my current career uh, experience here, um, but people with email addresses that look great when they were 16 and oh, 17. Yeah. Uh, Dark child flower of the night at... Yeah. yeah. Eater of human souls at... Oh, I don't know, that's <laughs> pretty badass. <laughs> it, it is, but, you know, if you're going to go and write a website for the insurance industry, is, is, is that really compatible <laughs> with sort of that future career choice? But there is some room for creativity with both email addresses and domain names, just because your first name, last name, dot com, for a lot of people is already gone. So there's there's space for appropriate creativity. And I think that's just it. People want to see appropriate creativity within the workplace. It's just a matter of getting a feel for bounds. And and again, if you're a wide bound individual, a wonderful human being that just spouts creativity across the whole spectrum. That's amazing, but that may not be right for certain employers. And really, if it's going to hurt you to conform to their expectations, is it really worth trying to waste the most valuable asset that you have, you know, your future life, trying to squeeze yourself into a box in which you don't fit? Oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah, I just think, to some degree, constrain yourself to the limits you're willing to be constrained. Be willing to move, be willing to re-innovate. And, you know, a domain name is cheap. If it's no longer you in three years' time, purge it. Destroy it from your CV, destroy it from your background. Redirect. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially redirect. Personality changes are very easy to enact on the internet, as long as you do it responsibly. Yeah. If everyone knows you as destroyer of enlightened souls, that could take a little bit of work to move on, but <laughs> stranger things have happened. So we've been talking a lot about juniors in terms of students, um, but I'm also really interested in adults who come into... Well, not that students aren't adults, Um Folks who are entering into tech as juniors who are slightly older. And I'm really interested in this because I think you've got a great opportunity to present some of your your past career skills, some of the things you've done, and their relevance to tech. What kinds of things would you be interested in seeing, like if you were chatting to older juniors? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a subject close to my heart as well, um, especially in the UK. We used to have so many night schools operating tech courses and things on these lines. And I can't help but think that with this insane rush to this all or nothing qualification at 21, 22 that we're seeing now, that the system itself is neglecting some of these people with arguably greater life skill and an awful lot to give and an awful lot of career ahead of them. You know, the difference between 20 and 40 is probably still an active 20 years in industry. Now, that's that's a good four or five employers on average for most people. I was just doing the math on how retirement works anymore. And yeah. I... Oh. Yeah, I try not to think about such things. That's that's manana. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about trying to get more experienced people to cross careers, to find the true paths. Incredibly important. So what can they offer? I think, really, when it reflects back to my experiences with juniors in the... What you end up doing is you realise quite soon that the digital, the whole IT field, once you start getting into computer programming and find the field that interests you and get those sort of reward mechanisms in where you're interested in developing yourself, that only takes a few months to set the seeds. And only a few years to start seeing really positive results. What becomes a lot more difficult for some people is actually learning the soft skills of team working, appropriate conduct in offices, of managing your manager is a, it's an incredibly difficult skill, which takes years to pick up. And for more experienced people trying to cross over into tech, there is such a wealth. And if you look back into it, yeah, just to kickstart that seed, to get to the point where you can use the internet to develop yourself is but a few months away from most capable people. So, yeah, I'm, I think the, the thing is to go for it. The other thing I'd say is that 
degrees have ch changed the landscape, really, in that we've now got a target of 50% of people going through degrees from university. Now, that really means that the degree isn't worth as much in employers' minds as it once was. Whereas now, if you can go in and you've got three years' relevant experience, now that doesn't even necessarily have to be commercial. If you've operated your own project site or a small little business on the side, such as a web merchant store. Open source projects. Uh, totally, yeah. And, and if you're a speaker on an open source project that you've run and you've done a few lectures and talks about it, chances are there's going to be lots of people in those audiences that would be... Oh, dear. Like the, the additional routes to self-promotion. Um, uh, for you listening... Absolutely go talk at Speak at a Meetup if you can. Um, it's less scary than you think it is. If you want to go to a conference and it's a little bit expensive, do you know that if you get accepted as a speaker, they, they give you a free ticket? Uh, these are absolutely fantastic ways. You don't have to be incredibly experienced. You don't have to be 50 years in industry. You could just say, do you know what? I found this great thing I want to talk about. And apply with that. See if people want to hear about it. I bet they will. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, this whole meetup speaking thing is so, so important to get out there. Meetups shouldn't be intimidating places to go to. As a meetup organiser, I'm sure they're the same, Jess. Do you have two problems? Firstly, getting attendees, and the second one is getting speakers. Uh, so uh, I run uh, the Open Code meetups, and we actually don't have speakers. We're just an open study space. So our big missions are making sure everyone plays nicely and it's newbie inclusive and just restocking biscuits, really. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> So, yeah, and it's, I think biscuits are probably easier to restock than speakers. But to, to attend a few meets, eat, especially if you're just starting out, because it's a great place just to get the informal, oh, have you seen this tutorial? Have you seen that tutorial? Uh, have you read my blog? Uh, <laughs> uh, then you can really quite easily get onto this whole learning ladder and then quite soon move on from that learning ladder just to discuss and describe your learning ladder with everyone else. People love to hear about these things. Lots of local meetups have loads of spaces. I see meetups cancelled quite often due to a lack of speakers. So it really is you know, an opportunity from all sides just to get involved with the local community, find new routes to develop yourself, help others develop others, create an established network, again, through mutual interest, and then to progress and establish yourself as if not an authority, at least somebody who is reasonably knowledgeable, a voice. well practiced, yeah, in a certain field. So we've had a really, really interesting chat so far. We've looked at the value non-traditional learners bring to technology. We're talking about different ways you can promote yourself. I was wondering if we could circle back around and take a look at some junior sites and, yeah, just sort of weigh in on what we both think about them. All of these sites for junior technologists that we're going to be looking at are folks who are actually looking for work right now. So if you, anybody hearing this thinks, wow, this person sounds fantastic, all of these sites and the contact details are available in the episode notes. The first site we're going to be looking at is from Yingrong in Atlanta, and we're going to be sort of taking a very, very nice critical look at this site. And what do you think about this site? Hey, that's uh, incredibly clean in terms of presentation. I think the way that uh, it describes the skills profile. It's very, very interesting. And uh, it seems to say that, yeah, I, I'm an individual, but I know how to adhere to standards. Yeah. So so looking at the site, as soon as you hit the site, it's a big white space saying, hello, I'm a web developer and food lover based in Atlanta. And I think this is fantastic because right from the start, we've got what you do and something that humanizes you, something that's warm. Say, hi, I'm a real human being. And on the World Wide Web, your actual geographical location is invaluable to potential employers. Yeah. But then if you scroll down very, very slightly, so at the bottom you can see two columns, what I know and what I'm learning. And I absolutely love this. I think this is just fantastic. Oftentimes when I speak to employers, I recommend breaking down job specs in more, more practical ways than we do now. So say, what do you expect this candidate to do in the first two weeks? What do you expect this candidate to be able to do after onboarding, after three months, what do you want them doing after a year? And right now, being able to see like, wow, this lovely gentleman can do, so, do Node.js, do Python, work with JavaScript, HTML, CSS now. If this is what I'm hiring for now, that's fantastic. I think there's some incredible cleverness and depth of experience shown on this uh, portfolio site because what they've done is explicitly describe their technical skills, yet there's an awful lot of knowledge that they've laid implicitly through the use of layout, through the use of language, through the, the control of the flow of the page uh, that really sort of defines them as a very standout potential applicant. It's very clean, easy to communicate. 
we scroll down just a tiny bit longer and we've got projects. So not just what the projects look like, which I always love because it's very visual, but also the GitHub and like the live site. We've got a really, really fantastic spread of here's my project, interact with it in really different ways. And a show code button that just seems seems quite wonderful. It's almost just inviting people who are interested just to carry on digging in. And really, it's it's a very, very clever site. And the, the, the pitch is there really for any potential employer to come on and say, I can now drill in, I can now follow these invitations, dig into the code base, see really the underlying technical skills of the person that I'm looking at. Um, but it doesn't do it in such a way that's in your face. It's very nicely constrained, very nicely ordered. And I think that's one thing. So when I when I chat to people about their sites, I always like to say that people on the web are lazy. Nobody's going to go to your portfolio site and then to your contact me and then to your CV. Making it the most self-contained journey possible is really valuable. And here, everything we need is on a one-page site. It really is like they've drawn themselves a map out of the information that the employer might be interested in and ensured that that journey is as short as possible. So as we scroll down to the very bottom of the site, the call to action, the thing that, that we're supposed to do, and to be honest, if I was hiring, the thing I would love to do, the call to action here is let's chat. That's fantastic. So right away, you can hear multiple ways to connect with me or download my resume. And to make it even better, there's a, there's a sort of support style text chat as you scroll down. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what the uptime on that one is. <laughs> when I get around to it. Um, this is an absolutely fantastic site, and we'll be linking to this in the show notes. I'd really like to encourage listeners who are looking to build their own portfolio site. This is a fantastic site for you to take a look at. This is going to be terrible because we're just going to have to say fantastic things over and over again because this next one, the next site we're going to be taking a look at is by Lynn. And this site has the menu bar sort of stacked along one side, which is a, a sort of very traditional looking site. Uh, and right from the start, it says, hello, which I, I love. I love that conversation. I'm Lynn. I'm a self-taught software developer. And we've got the well-established uh, icons in terms of LinkedIn and Twitter and other handles displayed along the bottom. Uh, so hopefully all of those are professional in terms of level of content and things along those lines. But it really does look like quite a clean and easy to access start I, this experience. Yeah, I really like this site. I almost wish we could have a little tiny bit more information right here on the splash page. Clicking through on the about me, we get a lot of the information I'd like to have sort of previewed on that first site. A junior Ruby developer. And I, I love this, keen to contribute to the right company. It'd be really nice to see that right from the start because if I've got Let's be honest, everyone thinks they have the right company. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, well, I think there's a subtlety here in that for some companies, they could get a stack of 150, 300 CVs. So I've heard of some really, really scary methods of filtering through these. It is totally and utterly legitimate if you've got a bias-free ordering of 300 CVs to take two, put them in the shredder, and put one on the maybe pile. Take two, put them in the shredder, put one on the maybe pile. Not every CV... Ah. <laughs> Jess is dying inside. That's, that's fine. Not, but, but from a busy employer's perspective, you may only have time to look at 50 CVs, and, and that means that you have to somehow fairly discard 250 of them. So getting your CV looked at can be difficult. I think the subtlety of trying to make sure that that homepage contains the key information means that if somebody is escaping through and has to look at 50 portfolio websites, then all of a sudden just having those key little bits of information right there on the front page can instantly mean that the person then can see, yes, maybe, or this won't go on the discard pile. One thing that Lynn's done on this website that not a lot of people do is she's included a photo. And I think this is really interesting. I think a lot of times we forget that humans are really visual animals. We love to connect with other people. We love to look someone in the eye. And we've just got a very, very professional photo of her smiling, wearing business dress. And it's a fantastic way to say, hey, I'm the self-taught technologist, also a human. Be nice. Get in touch. Yeah. And the, uh, the humanity is very, very clear in this one. It's clear that you're looking at an individual, a human being, rather than just a service offering. And uh, I think that's really important to communicate as well. People want to work with people. People aren't so keen about working with robots. Yeah. <laughs> And looking through her work, we've got this absolutely fantastic portfolio page. So up at the top, we've got a penguin eating game, which my biases are in play here. Anybody who makes games about penguins eating things, I think, should probably have fantastic, exciting jobs. Um, being old, this, this sort of game reminds me of my childhood. This is what I played uh, when I was eight, and uh, it's just such, such a fantastic thing to see in terms of this 
yeah, a little display of what's going on here. Is it a, just a little video clip? Or is yeah, it a yeah it's, a, it's an animated a... GIF. It's a fantastic idea. I'd love to see more portfolio sites showing animated GIFs of functionality. Uh, I'm going to nick this idea and uh, put a few animated GIFs on my site when I get round to... Uh, Lots of cats it. falling off of tables. Maybe a ha dancing hamster. <laughs> no, oh, that's getting facetious. This is amazing, though. This, this is a technique that's well worth looking at, well worth having a look at the notes for, and well worth visiting. And coming down a bit more, we've got an animated GIF showing a bit of the gameplay, which I absolutely love. And then a paragraph saying, you know what, this is an ongoing project. I'm still working on this. Here's the tech I've used. And then not just to see the code, the see the code button is here, um, but also play the game. Here I made this, play with it is fantastic. And this is really, really wonderful. And the beautiful thing about this is it's drawing in the person that is trying to evaluate into spending longer considering it. And, and that's really good. If somebody all of a sudden realizes that they've spent 15 minutes, 20 minutes just having their initial scan of your website, that's a fantastic piece of credibility to have in terms of uh, the application process. And then we've got another really great one. So we've got, uh, do you know about Free Code Camp? I haven't heard of that. I'm such a big Free Code Camp cheerleader. Um, you know, there are online learning environments like Code Academy or um, Udemy has some. Oh, so many, yes. Free Code Camp's a JavaScript one, and it's 1,600 hours. Wow. Uh, it's fantastic. I recommend it for anybody who says, I want to learn to code, but hasn't really moved far past that. I'll be making a note of that myself. Uh, really, really love it. And Lynn's included a Wikipedia viewer, so one of the projects really laid on. So she's gotten really, really far through Free Code Camp, maybe even finished it. Oh, my. And has included one of these projects. And I think that's really important. Like, if you are putting together a portfolio page, include projects you've done as learning. And I think the thing here is also to include projects that you're currently learning on. What am I currently looking into? What projects am I currently finding interesting? That's a tremendous way of uh, encouraging conversation, potentially an interview in terms of the current state of the industry and things along those lines, and uh, really starts to let the passion of where you're going and what you're looking at at the moment seep through. I talk to a lot of folks who, who want to wait on, on releasing their code or making stuff available, say, oh, this was a learning project, the code is garbage. But if you're learning... Six months from now, all code you've written is going to be garbage. And refactoring is such a wonderful part of the journey. To, if you're committing to Git regularly and you go and you want to start refactoring it, get it in there, get it live, and describe the refactoring journey. That's a really important part. Everybody has legacy systems. Everyone has code that needs to be improved. Demonstrating that you can take on a slightly less than perfect code base, that you can wrestle with it, and that you can turn it into something beautiful is uh, a skill that many employers, will, I think, will... Really appreciate. But we've uh, going through the rest of the site, we've got a blog with some really great technical contents, including not just projects documentation, which is fantastic, but also talking about real world experiences. Uh, so Lynn's talking about, we've got a blog post on my first hackathon. I love that. This shows me someone who's excited about networking, excited about getting to learn new things. I love this. And I think that honesty is really, really important because there's a big, big deficit in tech availability at the moment. There's an awful lot of people trying to find people to bring into tech. And there's a lot of companies out there that are willing to run training programs, willing to invest quite significantly in trying to onboard people. So if they can see, you know, genuinely where you are, honestly where you are, then that really gives you the best possibility of getting what we were talking about earlier in terms of the best match. Uh, the rest of the site, we've got some contact information. And this looks nice and clean as well. We just get in touch, here's an email, but also all of the social buttons below. So letting us know really, really clearly, this is the preferred way to contact, but you know, here's where I am on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just having the uh, email there on, on the actual website is just a really simple, lovely thing just to make it as easy as possible for potential employers to get in touch. And then at the very, very bottom, we've got a proper CV available. So written out, about me, code samples, Having the CV included is fantastic. If I had gotten midway through the site and really wanted to hire Lynn, which, again, I'm not hiring right now, but I absolutely do, this is a fantastic way of saying, you know what, here's something I can bring to my hiring manager and uh, say... Yeah, and I think uh, Lynn's CV is beautifully laid out. I know. Uh, if I'm you want so to put jealous. your CV online, this really is a fantastic reference to see how you should go about doing it. We're going to go on to the next site, and this site actually does something I usually recommend people don't. I usually recommend against having big images that take up the sort of the before the fold section of the website. And this site absolutely does that. This is Laurie O'Connor's site. 
And if you're interested in this and want to hire Lori, you should absolutely hire Lori. Um, all of these sites are going to be listed in the episode notes. But she's got a huge picture taking this up. And, well, it's, it's not just a picture. It's it, This is a kind of a work of art, really, isn't it's it? It's beautiful. Uh, I'm assuming that Laurie composed this herself, and if so, it's a, it's a tremendous calling card. Yeah, so it's sort of a, a beautiful, very techy uh, self-portrait, which is absolutely flawless. I'm terribly jealous. And this does a, lo- a lot of the same things that the, the photo in the past one did. Hi, I'm here, I'm a human too. But with the added layer that it's not just saying I'm a human, I'm a talented human, I'm a clever human, look what I can do. And whether or not this is something she's done herself or something she's contracted out, it shows incredibly good taste and a lot of really, really fantastic web design savvy. It certainly makes me want to know know more about Laurie. Yeah. So from this site, we've got really great navigation options as well. We've got all of, we've got sort of a top bar where we've got home about tools, or we can just scroll down. And we've got the about right here. I think this is fantastic. It it's really is a model introductory sentence, isn't it? Hi, I'm Laurie, a front-end web developer based in Kitchener, Ontario. It's everything you need just in that first sentence. But I'm in love with the second one, where it's like my favorite part of being a front-end developer is seeing a project from start to finish. This is warm, it's personable. It's also saying, I like this thing that's hard to find in industry. And again, continue building on JavaScript and React. And what we were talking earlier, I'm also interested in learning more about web accessibility and Node. All of these these portfolio sites so far have just been sort of 10x humans, folks who are absolutely fantastic and so interesting. But I love this because Lori isn't sort of a student coming at it for the first time. She says, you know what, before coding, I was a department head who managed a remote team. Wow. So this is saying, you know what, I've, I've moved into a job in tech. I'm, I'm t- transitioning into the industry, but here are the skills I'm bringing in that are going to be really valuable for your team. And this is a very, very strong hand that Lloyd's delivering very confidently. Yeah, I, I love that. I, um, no waffling, no, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm just getting started, just like, hi, I'm fantastic for these reasons. And Lori's absolutely fantastic for these reasons. Uh, I think if anyone out there just wants to know where you should be presenting yourself, how, how to achieve confidence without being overconfident, <laughs> Read this. I was going to say all three of these so far have just been absolutely stellar. I'm so so jealous. Each playing to their own strengths as well. It's really, really wonderful to see people expressing themselves differently, but coming across so well. And as we scroll down past this incredible bio, we've got tools really laid out clearly. And again, it's, it's what we've seen on the other sites. It's this implicit with supporting statements saying, you know, these are my soft skills. These are how I understand the context of what you want from me. But this is what I've got to back up technically. So one thing I think is notable here that I absolutely love is we've got JavaScript, CSS, React, Gulp. We've got the the technical skills you'd expect. But there's also a a field here for Trello. Which is amazing to say, wonderful. And this this really indicates to me that Lori knows how software engineering teams tend to work together um, and is is sort of interested in collaboration tools. Yeah, and Trello is a nice tool to have on there because there's just enough know-how to get it working as a team to make it so it is... Uh, oh, yeah, rather than a, of course. <laughs> yeah. And I think explicitly stating skills, even when they sound, don't seem like something, they, even if they don't seem special to you, oftentimes employers love those. I think that some of it goes back to documenting your learning journey. If you go back through your learning journey and you found that you spent some time trying to get to terms with something, instantly then that's a great big marker that it's relevant and it's worth sharing. One of my favorite CVs I've seen recently, and the person's got a job, so I'm not going to listed conflict revolution in their skills. Wow. It wasn't a management role. It wasn't, but yes, absolutely. If you are good at managing your manager or diffusing that guy on the team, tell me about it. So right after we look at tools for Lori, which I would almost want to call tools and skills, or you know what, let's leave it. Lori's a genius. I trust her good judgment. We scroll down just a little bit further and we can see her projects. Oh, wow, that's such a lovely way of displaying this. Um, Yeah, I I always like to warn people that you don't need to worry that much about design unless design is your business. Mm. But the design on this is flawless. It is beautiful. And I I think this is a wonderful thing that we've seen three different ways of communicating projects so wonderfully. And this one's at a glance, so we can sort of see very, very quickly the spread of what kinds of things do these look like in general. But at the same time, we've got the same call to action that we've seen on the other sites where we can both view the project live or see the code on GitHub. I think what's interesting here is where 
Laurie's broken down sort of features and aspects. So with the first one, you've got pair programming, JavaScript, responsive, you know, key skills. The second one, it goes into features of the application quite seamlessly, but in a way that kind of... It flows. It flows, but it reinforces and expands. So convert PSD to HTML5 CSS. Creation um, of reusable code, for example. So it's just mixing the whole thing up in a way that, yeah, is delightful. We're seeing sort of a learning journey through these projects. Like, do you know what? This is what I focused on. This is what I really learned and took away. And I think it's fantastic. But we come down just a little bit further and look at this. We've got contact forms. And the nice thing here is it's an option. The email address yeah. is still very much present. We've got the location noted right here, which I absolutely love. But it also says in line, like, you know what? I'm willing to lo relocate for an absolutely perfect opportunity. If I was going to be really, really critical, you know, really splitting hairs here, the one thing that might just enhance it ever so subtly is the scope of relocation. Is it global? Is it statewide? Is it national? And, like, where would you love to be? Like, willing to relocate for the right opportunity or any opportunity in Naimeha. Yes, yeah, yeah, it'd be lovely, but an incredibly strong piece again. Ah, uh, no, it's beautiful. So we're going to move on to the very last site. And this one, a lot of the things I've said, I love this, I love this, I love this. This next site kind of breaks all the rules, but it's so irrepressibly creative that I just couldn't get past this. So I'm looking forward to this. And this is a website by Vida, and this is, you come up and it's, it's very flat. It's very sort of 1998. Yeah, but in, in, a, in a nice way, it's, I think if it was released in 1998, it would be... Far, far beyond its time. There's no under-construction GIFs. Uh, there's no flashing web ring adverts. So it's a clean 1998, just using the basics of uh, really font layout to try to communicate. But it's, it's really done as a, as a script, and it's called Website, a play by Vedia. And this is absolutely fantastic. I love this. It has just this little bit of pull about it that just makes you want to scroll down and just carry on reading. Um, we've got 2017, Edinburgh, it's raining. We've got the film directions right at the start. I love this. So, and it asks questions, you know, where's the relevance? Oh, is it Edinburgh? Is this where you're based? Is this just part of a script? Let's have a little look and carry on reading. Yeah. So we come down and we see that Act 1, The Essentials, Scene 1, Introduction. And this is just giving us the CV, Twitter, and email. This is just letting people self-serve if they want to opt out of this narrative experience. And, yeah, so Act, act 1 introduction and then f and the first word highlighted, designer. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, so we do really get to see fantastic design from a fantastic designer. And, and this use of highlighting is very, very clever. So further down the screen, you've got highlighted, I enjoy making small personal games that focus on narration and empathy. So this very, very clever use of highlighting and also language just to sort of say that I am a human being, I am a person, I am somebody that you would like to meet and discuss and talk to. And, and telling me that you enjoy making small narrative games, making narrative experiences in this fantastic sort of print feel narrative experience is flawless. And the, uh, the next sentence is, is, is such a lovely delight. I took part in a one game a month for over two years, making tiny experiments that were published on itch.io with a link such as tiny experiments is highlighted. So as you're just cascading your yeah. eyes down the screen, it's a little pause point, tiny experiments. Such a wonderful little concept. I'm not trying to write a monolith according to my vision. I'm going to experiment, I'm going to test, I'm going to find my way around. And then you've got link, 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 link. The thing is, all of this information is beautiful. We've got these really, really fantastic projects. Yearly, a, a game, narrative game about loneliness and early adulthood. And looking at the way this is laid out, it feels like a well-thumbed script where, where bits have been highlighted, where it's been written and rewritten so that it's just clean and beautiful and perfect. And the clever thing now is the third-party aspect that you've just sort of implied with the highlighting. So the highlighting isn't really just where they want to emphasise, it's where somebody else would emphasise the points. It's very much putting themselves in the eye of the reader, which is so clever. It's building this sort of mutually connected web of empathy, and it's absolutely flawless. Delightful, totally delightful. Um, and then we've got, we've got more things. So we've got part, scene two, community. I love this. Don't just tell me about what you've built. Don't just tell me about your skills. Tell me about things you've done with other humans. Yeah, and I think what you're saying really, Jess, is what people should take away from this in terms of the, what is being communicated. 
I'd hate to see people trying to copy this because oh. this is a one-off. But the lessons of what they're saying and how they're saying it and where they're emphasising is something that I think anyone can apply to their own side. If you've got a creative, silly idea that's absolutely you, go with that. If you're trying to copy a creative, silly idea that's absolutely someone else, I, I feel like if anyone else tried to do this, it might fall terribly flat. And I, and I think out of this, Vadia is communicating in a way that says that they may not necessarily be right for every opportunity, but there's going to be opportunities out there that are going to be perfect for each other. Yeah, I wish that arts funding did discovery like this, because, yeah, I, I just want there to be a pot of money for people who do projects like this. Creation, what else? So we've got speaking information, which is fantastic. It's a short paragraph with the speaking appearances highlighted. Such a good form. And then other things. Design, like, what you can hire Vadia for. You know what? I make simple one-page websites. And here are some great examples. I design logos. And, oh, logos, you say? Posters and flyers take pictures. Uh, write music. Only the word music is highlighted. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the time you're coming through long here, the confidence. I mean, this screams that I am brilliant because I don't need to put all of this in your face. You can go and have a look at it, but by this point, you really get the feel that you're dealing with somebody that's incredibly, incredibly good at what they do. And, and someone who absolutely knows it. So with this one, I, it goes very, very strongly against a lot of things I recommend. And one of the things I often recommend is have one or two clear goals. Say, hey, I'm, you can hire me to do this thing. And this is, this is just someone who's just like, do you know what? It doesn't directly say I'm brilliant, but you know what? I'm brilliant. I'm actually fantastic at all of these. Please get in touch with me about these multiple things that I do. Or any of these things or a, a, a link of all of these things. Yeah. So, yeah, it just strikes me as being the ultimate calling card. And I love this. Act three being the future. Act three, scene one, the future projects. What I'm working on now, this is so good. Um, and then uh, scene two is employment. And this is a really, really clear call to action. I'm available for short contracts. Also, internships. Yeah. I mean, y'all do internships, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, internships really are becoming uh, quite a good growth area for employers at the moment. It's a great way of trying to establish your own procedures for taking on interns, for taking on people with less tech experience. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a drying pool, and I think more and more employers are sw switching on to the fact that they really need to be part of the training as well as just the hiring. Uh, that's something I'm really interested in because that's really part of the industry's responsibility. So we need to create better pathways for folks to get into tech who are excited about it. And then we need to make sure that there's appropriate support and training as we're doing this. Yeah, and it's it's a difficult field to get right. And I think the, the whole summer internship way is such a great way of having an employer experiment because employers need to learn as well. The, the learning journey isn't isolated to the applicants. It's, it's a learning journey for groups of people, for employers, for communities, for groups. And uh, yeah, everybody is on this learning journey together. That is a fantastic note to end this on. If you've been listening and you're in the position to hire, any of these folks who we've featured today are absolutely fantastic and available for hire right now. And if you're listening to this wanting a little bit more information on building your portfolio and personal website as a junior technologist, I'm going to be running a free webinar on Thursday, July 6th. If you want more information on that, check out the episode notes and we'll show you how to sign up. If you can't make it, or if you're listening to this far, far in the future, don't worry, we'll make a YouTube link available as soon as it's finished. Thank you so much for listening. 